Good morning. Welcome to Clear Springs Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us today, we're glad to have you. We are still filling in for Tony, and we're anxious for him to be back next yes. week. <laughs> so, but in the meantime, we're glad you're here. Would you stand and sing with us, Holy, Holy, Holy.
good to be in God's house. Thank you all for being here this morning. And let's have a word of prayer and we'll continue with our worship. Dad, we're going to pray. <laughs> Father, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for the time that we have together today to make us a family. And thank you for covering us with the blood of Jesus. And Father, I pray that as we continue in this service, that your will will be accomplished in our life. We just thank you that you love us in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing Count Your Blessings. And you know, no matter what any of us have going on in our lives. You can lives, sit down. Um, <laughs> We can always count our blessings. There are trials and tribulations that we go through every day, and, and I know that there are a lot of us here that are going through a lot of different things, but the one thing that, that we can stand on is the fact that God is sovereign. He's always there. He'll always take care of us. He's always there to listen to us when nobody else will, or he's, the Holy Spirit is there to intercede on our behalf when we don't have the words. And we are truly blessed. So will you join us in singing Count Your Blessings? stand on this last song uh, because he lives.
leadership. Kelly, thank you, and uh, Karen, thank you all for stepping in. I always appreciate your willingness. It's great to have a choir again, isn't it? Amen. I'm so pleased to have them. Also, I want to thank you for some time away last week. We got our son moved in. Thanks to Dad for uh, filling in, and you may want him. I, I hesitate to let Dad preach much because you're going to want him instead of me, but uh, I appreciate him stepping in and I have to tell you I couldn't ask for a better father and uh, we are very close and I love him and he's been a great mentor to me through the years if you have your if you have your copy of the Lord's Word uh, we'll be looking in Acts chapter 5 Acts chapter 5 and today I want to preach on vacation Bible school now vacation Bible school is not in the scripture you know that but what we do in vacation Bible school is certainly in the scripture and so we're going to talk about what we do uh, in Vacation Bible School. As you know, programs come and go in our life. Various ministries that we have done in the past we no longer do. Look at the music's changing, the way we dress changes, everything changes. But what we do for the Lord never changes. The way we live our life for Christ never changes. And I was coming across, I was looking up some stuff about Vacation Bible School. And you know, it began back in the 1890s. Uh, uh, by a fellow by the name of Miles, uh, D.T. Miles. He was up in Virginia, and he uh, started some, some classes for kids in the summer, and it took, it took on, it was a hit, and it has grown into what it has become today. I remember going to VBS when I was a child. We didn't call it VBS back then. We just called it Bible school. Remember Bible school, and now it's vacation Bible school. It's probably always been vacation Bible school, but we just called it Bible school. And I came across some statistics that I thought you might find interesting. These are a few years old, back in, uh, back in uh, 2018, and this is from the Southern Baptist Convention, 25% of all baptisms uh, reported by Southern Baptist churches come from Vacation Bible School. 25%. Um, 10% of the people that are enrolled in Vacation Bible School don't go to church anywhere. They don't have any affiliation with the church uh, of any kind. Two and a half million kids attended Vacation Bible School in 2018. There were 155 plus, a thousand prospects discovered in Vacation Bible School that year. On and on we could go. 15 hours of intense discipleship, sharing the gospel daily. Here's one that I love. Seven months of ministry in one week. Seven months of ministry in one week. 70,000 salvation decisions in 2018. Now, folks, we have an opportunity coming up this next week, don't we? And I know it's a lot of fun. I'm going to have a big time. I plan on having a lot of fun. You may even see me in short pants. That right there is worth coming just for the freak show. But I will tell you this. We're going to have a lot of fun together. And we have a class for everyone. So let me just ask you to stand. Let's read this passage of Scripture. This is where the apostles, uh, right after, you, you remember, they had, the church had just been formed. They were going out and they were sharing the gospel. And they had uh, shared the gospel. And in Acts 5, 17, it says, The high priests and his officials who were Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They were filled with the attention that the apostles were receiving by sharing the gospel. Now, they weren't sharing the gospel for attention, were they? They were sharing the gospel because it was their mandate. 
but yet they were getting attention. And in verse 18, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But an angel of the Lord came at night, opened the gates of the jail, brought them out. Then he told them, go to the temple and give the people this message of life. So at daybreak, the apostles entered the temple, and as they were told, uh, and immediately began teaching. Let me just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for uh, uh, the truth that it has. And Father, I pray that you would allow us to understand the urgency of sharing the message of life. And Father, that we would do so with reckless abandonment to this world. We would have a renewed commitment uh, commitment to faithfulness of your word. So Father, we thank you for loving us and for the time we have together. Open our hearts and minds to the truth of your word today. In Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. There's an outline provided there if you uh, would like to follow along there. And we can see that the apostles were very bold. If you just read down toward the end of the chapter, uh, they went out and they preached that gospel. And what happened to them? They were arrested and beaten because they had been obedient to sharing and giving the people the message of life. And here we are today in our churches. And we have been called to do the same thing, haven't we? We've been called to be faithful to teach this, uh, this uh, gospel that we've been given. And it's a difficult thing to do. I think one of the greatest needs that we have today is to uh, give ourselves to that task. And, and how do we do that? Well, we have to have concentrated uh, prayer. We have to have selfless service. We have to certainly be uh, studying the Word of God. I believe that one of the most important things is prayer. We have to get back to prayer in the church. And, and it's not that we don't pray. I'm talking about a consistent uh, prayer for the things of God in our life. We've been seeing revival through our nation in different places. And it, it comes when we go and ask God to do His business with us. Where we find where He's working and we join in on what's going on in, his, in, in, in the world. And I believe that it begins with prayer. We find that church in Jerusalem, they uh, shook the world because they were together in one accord in prayer. In Acts uh, 1, it says, They were continued united in prayer along with all the women, including Mary and the mother of Jesus and his brothers. And the number of people who were together were about 120. They were all together in prayer. Uh, in Acts 12, Peter was kept in prison, but what? The church was praying fervently for God, uh, to God for him. The, there's something powerful about the church of God coming together in prayer. You've heard the old expression, we've got to stop playing and, stop pr and start praying. Well, I think we can do both this week, don't you? I think we can have some fun, certainly. But we need to bathe everything that we're going to do in the power of prayer and ask the Lord to put His hand on us and move. Because VBS starts tomorrow evening. The question is, are you going to pray? Will you serve? Will you, uh, will you study? And will you attend? Now, here's, here's the reality. We have a class for everyone. We have classes from preschool through adults. Dad's going to be in here. My dad's going to be in here teaching uh, the adults every night. So you come at 6 o'clock. We'll give you a meal. You'll have a good meal to eat, good fellowship. And we'll come in here. Y'all don't have to go through the children's time. We're going to separate that out this year and put it in the fellowship hall. And you want to be impressed by... Uh, by uh, Brother Mike's handiwork. He decorated it up really nice. And so we're going to be able to go in there and enjoy that. But today, I fo let's focus on three things that we need to keep in mind this coming week uh, for Vacation Bible School. First of all, we must make a commitment to the lost. To the lost. We want lost people to come to church. We want lost children to come to this church. We want lost families to come to this church. We want folks who are confused and are downtrodden, who have a difficult time in life, because the answer is Jesus. We have to remember the lost. And I think one of the greatest purposes that the Lord leaves us on earth is to share the gospel. When he went up to heaven, he could have taken all of us with him. He could have just bypassed. Have you ever thought about that? When you, get in, uh, when you receive forgiveness of your sins and re are redeemed, he could have at that moment, he could have spared us all the trouble, all the heartbreak, all the trials that we're going through in this world and fast forwarded us immediately into heaven. But he's allowed us to stay here and do the work of sharing the message of life. He's allowed us to stay here and, uh, and go through and grow and witness for him. We have to have a commitment to the lost. 
We have to have a vision for the lost. We have to have a love for the lost. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Did you hear what that said? He came to earth to seek and to save the lost. Paul was a great apostle, and he had a vision for the lost. He said in Acts 20, uh, Be on alert, remembering day and night for three years, I have never stopped warning each of you with my tears. He had a compassion for the lost. In, in 1 Timothy, he told Timothy that it's a trustworthy saying that Jesus Christ came to the world to save sinners. We have to keep our eyes on the lost. I think that people who are growing Christians, people who are in the Word of God, who are in prayer, who selflessly serve, have a vision for the lost. They have a vision for the lost. They want to know uh, the, the salvation uh, situation of people's lives. Paul said that he never stopped, he never ceased to warn everybody day and night of the coming judgment. He did that with tears of compassion. Compassion. Not judgment, not how did you mess your life up, but the answer is Jesus. He had compassion for their souls. In fact, he went as far to say that he would be cursed if they could come to Christ. That's compassion. He had a great commitment for the lost. I fear today that our nation is more lost than it's ever been. I think that our nation is more lost than it's ever been. I think most of us would agree on that. But I think a lot of times that the Christian uh, response to the lostness of this country is leaning up and, and crossing our arms and, and saying, you know, I don't even recognize our country anymore. And I'm afraid of what my grandchildren are going to face. And you know what? Me too. I'm, I'm afraid of what my grandchildren will face in this country. But the answer is not social conservatism. The answer is not some, some government policy. It's not a particular candidate that runs for a political office or some other worldly response. What's the answer? The answer is Jesus. Jesus is the only hope that we have for this world. We can't put our, our, uh, hang our hat on anything else in this world. The Lord did not come to save this earth. He came to save souls. He came to seek and save the lost. This world's lost. And we have to have a vision for the lost. We have to have a commitment for the lost. We must have that commitment. But not only that, we have to have remember that hell is a real place. I think sometimes we forget that hell is a real place. I think sometimes we dumb it down as if it's some kind of philosophical point in a conversation that we're having with somebody. People die without Christ, go to hell. The scripture teaches that there is a real, literal hell, that it's a real place, and that the lost uh, will spend their eternity separated from God in a devil's hell, tormented. And I don't know about you, but I believe that hell's a real place. I believe the Word of God. I believe that it tells us that it's a terrible place where the unbeliever will spend their entire eternity. In fact, Jesus took it seriously. Jesus said in, in Matthew 5, If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it's better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than the whole body to be thrown into hell. In fact, he goes on, he says, If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to go to hell. And you know, I believe today that people are not just uh, apathetic about Jesus they are antagonistic against Jesus. We were talking about that yesterday, coming back from decorating the... Jane and I were talking about that in the car, that people are antagonistic against Christ. They're not just like, take it or leave it. Why else would the thief on the cross reject Christ? What else would he... What other hope would he have? He was dying. The other one said, don't you fear God? We have a, a world that's lost and we need to share the good news of Christ. Why? Because hell is real. I heard an old preacher say one time, if I could just somehow take the people in my congregation and, and just for five minutes show them the reality of hell, it wouldn't take months or weeks to uh, reach this world for Christ. It would take days. I think the problem with... Uh, a problem today is that only a, a handful of Christians really believe in a real hell. 
I think, uh, I mean, in a real, real hell. And then only a few of those really believe in the reality of the grasp of the torment of hell. It's punishment. Folks, we need to remember that hell is real. It's a real place. And we need to remember it throughout this coming week. We need to pray that the Lord would allow us to have his eyes as we see these children that walk through this place because one day they will be grown adults. Why is there such a push today for all this perverted social agenda to get into the schools? Because they, go, they know those children will one day be adults. Let's, let's have that same mindset and, and reach these children for Christ. Give them the hope, the message of life. We need to remember that hell is a real place and it will change the way that we have this casual, apathetic way of going about doing the Lord's work. It will get us on the job of sharing the gospel. It will get us on the job of, of sharing the good news to the families. The reality is that the work of Vacation Bible School starts not this week, but next week. Because we're going to have a bunch of folks come in here, hopefully. We're all praying for it, aren't we? A bunch of lost folks coming in here. And we hope that next week it can follow up and knock on some doors and make some, uh, some contacts with families and reach them for Christ. We need to get on the job of sharing the gospel to these families, to the community, and to the entire world. We have to have a commitment to the lost. We have to have a commitment to the lost. We have to have a commitment uh, to the fact that there is a real hell that these lost uh, people are going uh, to without Christ. Jesus came and gave everything he had so that they could skip hell and, and enjoy the hope of eternity with him. We have to have a commitment to loss, and we also have to remember that hell is real. And that's the destination of those outside of Christ. But also, we have to, must live like Jesus in front of the loss. I think that's one of the biggest things that we make a mistake as Christians today, I see. Is that we have blurred the lines between living holy a uh, righteous life of God and living in this world. We want to compartmentalize our life to such an extent that we can come and go at will about where, where we want to be, what we want to do, how we want to represent Christ in various situations of life. Proverbs 28 says, Whoever walks uprightly shall be saved, but he that is perverse in his ways shall fall at once. We have to walk in the ways of Christ. If we have accepted Christ, we're a new creation. We're brand new. And we need to walk that way. It seems to me that many Christians today are getting further and further away from the separation of this world and its ways. We are coming together and merging it in to one thing. Look at the denominations today. Why are there splits? Why is all this stuff going on? Because we've allowed the world to creep in and, and uh, take the place of the, the truth of God's Word. This is truth. We don't get to come in here and say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Keep it to yourself. That's not what the Lord tells us to do. I think we're forgetting that we have to be separated from this world. Folks, we have to, uh, to claim Christ and walk in his ways. What's happened today? What's happened to the commitment and to the faithfulness, to the obedience of living a holy life? Peter says, be holy for God is holy. We have to, to live that name. We have to carry the name of Christ. When Moses came and, and asked God, who shall I say sent me? And he says, I am that I am. He was giving him a relationship. And then later he gave him the Ten Commandments and said, don't take my name in vain. He wasn't talking about the way that he spoke the name. Now that's part of it. He's saying, I have put my name on you. Bear my name the way I tell you to bear my name, with holiness and righteousness. We are carrying the name of Christ. We need to be very careful to uh, carry the name the way that he would have for us to carry his name. We should act differently and look differently and talk differently and, and live differently, even dress differently than this world. We need to be different because we have been given the Lord Jesus in our lives. The scripture has told us to separate ourselves from this world. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 6, Come out from among them and be separated. How can we expect to reach the world for Christ when all we do is give a lip service? 
When we stand back and say, yeah, you need to do this, but there's no difference in our life than anybody else's life. We have to, to, uh, to live our lives for Christ. We complain about the world and then we just don't even look like Christ. We don't look any more like Christ than the world looks like Christ. First Peter, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are to be different from this world. Folks, we're not better, but we are different. We are different. It, it seems today that we, uh, we have lost that understanding of that. I remember when we lived in New Orleans, and many of you can relate to this. You get cleaned up, you get ready to go to work or go outside, and you can't make it to your car for you're wet with sweat. I don't mind getting sweaty if that was on the agenda, right? But when I get cleaned up, I don't want to get dirty again. I don't get dirty again. We had, a, we had some faculty that lived on campus, and, the, and we had a, at 7... 30 in the morning, we had a, a prayer meeting for all the faculty. And so uh, he would, <laughs> we never walked to that because of, 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 this, of the humidity. And this guy moved in next to me, brand new professor, first day. He put on his suit and tie and he walked. I mean, I tell you what, he might as well jumped in the swimming pool. He was wet head to toe. He had to turn right around after prayer meeting and go change his clothes. Take a shower. I don't want to get dirty once I've been made clean. And I believe that that's exactly what we're doing in our life. We, we've been made clean. The Lord has come in and He has made us brand new. He has cleaned us. We are redeemed in the, in the blood of Christ. Why in the world would we want to wallow in the mud uh, of this world? We need to be different. We need to be men of, and women of God. We need to be different in this world and live for Christ. John, the apostle... And it means so much because remember how he and his brother interacted with Christ, asking if he could bring, a, a, you know, judgment down on these people. Uh, back when, before the Lord uh, uh, was crucified, back when they were doing their ministry on the earth. And then after, he's such a, uh, the Holy Spirit come in and give him such a, a love for the church. And he says, don't be, uh, do not love the world or the things of this world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, of the eyes, the pride of one's possessions is not from the Father, but it's from this world. And the world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. Folks, this world and the things of this world are passing away. Where do you find your value in life? Where do you want to put your identity? I hope it's not in this world because it's passing away. I know there's a temptation there. I get it. But people are watching. The lost are watching. Hell is real and the lost are watching. They want to see if Christians really know the message of life. If they're living that message of life. They want to know that, they have, that Christ really gives power and strength to walk through the mountains and the valleys of their life. That's on us. We need to be faithful as we walk through this world. We have to have a commitment for the lost. We have to remember that hell is real and we have to live like Jesus in front of the lost. You may say, well, preacher, I, I believe everything you're saying. I agree with it, everything you're saying. I know it comes from the Word of God, but I just don't know how I can do that in my life. I don't know how I can, can live that life. Folks, I want you to remember that Jesus didn't want to go to the cross he prayed and asked the Lord to remove that cup from him. But what did he do? He was submissive to the will of his Father. And we are the beneficiaries of his submission. I would just say, remember the cross. Remember the cross. Paul says, for the word, uh, for the word of the uh, cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but it is the power of God to those who are being saved. We can do that because their power in the cross is where Jesus shed his blood for us. Amen? It's where we uh, have this life that has been given to us. It's where we, Jesus died for you and me, and we, we can't forget about the power of the cross. It's where the evil of one has been stripped of all his power. Satan has been defeated. Paul says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with eloquent Wisdom so that the cross of Christ will not be emptied of his effect. 
all the focus is on what Jesus did on the cross. On the cross. That's why we remember the lost. That's why Jesus came to save the lost from a devil's hell. That's why we have to live separate from this world. Because Jesus came and gave us new life. Paul says, as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. I'm separated. The power of the cross in me has given me the power to do what the Lord's called me to do. The Lord came from heaven to die on the cross to make a way for us to live free and forever with Him. Do we believe in Him? Do you believe in Him today? Is that where your salvation is? Hopefully you put your trust into Him for your salvation. Are you a child of God? The reality is this week in Vacation Bible School, we will have children and families that do not know the forgiveness of Christ in these buildings. That's the truth. That's our prayer, isn't it? And we're going to have a lot of fun. I hope we do. Eat some ice cream. Eat some other food that we probably shouldn't be eating. Having a lot of fun, singing some songs, decorating, all those things. But don't forget that there were 25% of all baptisms reported came from Vacation Bible School. That there's seven months of ministry in one week. There's many, a lot of money given to missions. 15 hours of intense discipleship. That we get to share the gospel daily with the lost. Will you make a commitment to the lost? Well, you're going to make a commitment to the lost. Why? Because hell is real. It's real, and we have to live like Jesus and share the message of life like those apostles did all those uh, years ago. All those years ago. It cost them. They were beaten just right after that. And it was a cycle, as you know. P -p -p the apostle Paul... I think he spent half his life in jail getting beat up because he was sharing the message of life. We have an opportunity, folks, to come and give our lives to Christ and to live that Christ-like life in front of this world. We make that commitment this week. I want to ask us to do something. I know this is a little unorthodox, but I want to ask us just to stand for a moment. And I want to ask those who are in uh, leadership of Vacation Bible School to come down front. If you would, just be so kind to come down front. And we're going to pray over you all. Y'all don't have to come down. Just those who are, uh, I don't care what you're doing. If you're sweeping the floor this week, you come down. You come down front. I want to pray over you. And y'all pray there as well. Uh, and... Um, Let's just, y'all can get together. You don't have to like stand awkwardly around looking at each other. Let's get together as a family of God. Let me pray and then I want us to have a little time of invitation after this. Father, I just pray for these dear men and women of God. I pray that even now you would just lay your hand upon each and every one of them. Uh, we have a big task in front of us this coming week. And Father, I pray that you would just anoint us with the power of your Holy Spirit to do the work that you've put in front of us. Father, that we would be found faithful, that we would be the stewards that you have called us to be. Father, we just thank you so much for the honor of being called your servants. And Father, I pray that even now, even now as we are still in the, uh, the stages of preparation uh, and anticipation of what you're going to do this week, that we would be used powerfully by you. Father, that we would make a commitment to the lost today. That we would commit ourselves to sharing the gospel of Christ. Father, that we would make a commitment to, uh, to live our lives in front of the lost and be like Jesus in front of the lost. Father, I pray that we would always remember that you have come to seek and to save those who are lost and that you would just remind us of the reality of hell. Father, I pray for these new people. I pray for uh, those that we are anticipating uh, coming. Father, we pray that even now you would stir in their hearts. If some are on the fence, if it's just a maybe we should go, I don't know, kind of attitude, that you would just end their work in their lives even now to bring them to your house so that we could share the good news of Christ, that you could change their life, give them the hope, save them from a devil's hell so that they can enjoy the hope and salvation of Christ from now and all eternity. So, Father, we pray that you would just work powerfully in your people today. In Jesus' name, and amen, amen.
all right, y'all can go back. We're going to have a time of invitation. And you may think, well, I, I didn't come down front. That doesn't mean anything. All that means is that you're on prayer duty. You're on prayer duty. Each and every one who didn't came down front, you guys down here, you're on prayer duty as well. We're all on prayer duty this week, and you come and be a part of the uh, adult uh, activities as well. We're going to just have a time of, of, of singing, and uh, you all come and pray. The altar is open as the Lord leads. Just go ahead. Well, amen. Thank you all for your faithfulness today. Isn't it good to be in God's house? Amen. I'm excited about this week, and I appreciate you all uh, so very much. And I pray that we have a great week. If you know some folks, give them a phone call to this afternoon. And uh, it, uh, anybody you can think of, just say, come on. We're going to have a great time in the Lord, a great time of fellowship. You know, that's the interesting thing about being uh, a servant of God, is that when we get to come together, it's a sweet time, isn't it? It's just a sweet time to come together and be the family of God, working together on the things of God. So I want you to come and be faithful to that. And don't forget, we have an adult class for everyone. You come and be a part of that. Brother Mike, come on.